Lord be with you. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Marilyn. Also, if anybody's missing a Tupperware dish, um, anybody? Sweet, free Tupperware. All right. Well, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Luke chapter 23. We're going to pick up where Allie left off this morning, verse 26, but we're only going to read the verse 49. I'll save you the, the last verse there. Luke chapter 23, beginning there with verse 26. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. They laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others? Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray for ears to hear, for minds and hearts open to receive what you have for us. God, help us to hear your words, your spirit calling to us. And Lord, give us the courage to respond in faithfulness and in love. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I I was sitting in the floor in my grandmother's living room the first time it happened. The first time I heard God speak. I couldn't have been much older than five or six because I really don't recall many other Sunday afternoons waiting for dinner after church at Grandma's house. 
You see, my family, our church attendance dropped down to nothing after my granddad died, after my dad went through his second divorce, after my aunt went through her whatever number it was. And our family was deemed just a little too sinful, I suppose, to be kept in good fellowship with the church that we were members of. But on one of those Sundays, I clearly remember sitting in the floor in the living room at Grandma's house when I heard this low grumble, this this sort of rumbling sound that seemed to come from some ethereal place. And I think I I brushed it off at at first, but then, then I heard it again, this low sort of mumbling I looked around the room, my uncle, my cousins were in there. No one seemed to notice what had just happened. So naturally, having just spent the morning in Sunday school in children's church, probably just drinking red Kool-Aid and eating cheese puffs, but still, I assumed this strange noise was supernatural. So when I heard it again, I I asked aloud, did anyone else hear that? My uncle David looked at me and said, hear what? Boy, God must be talking to you. I couldn't believe it. God was talking to me. Of course, God didn't make a whole lot of sense, but God was talking to me. Not speaking real clearly, but God was talking to me. And so I waited, as one does, to see if the Lord would speak again. And sure enough, you know what happened? That same noise, that low growl. And so I said something akin to, What do you want, God? What are you trying to say, God? And that's when my uncle started to laugh. Because it turns out God wasn't speaking to me. His stomach was speaking to him. Maybe like some of yours will in a minute. Now you may laugh at such a story. I I, I do, looking back. But when I was telling it to Dr. Betty Talbert, she was the spiritual formation director at Truett Seminary during my time there. I worked in her office, wrote some curriculum for her. Uh, Dr. Talbert was a, a little, little different. She leaned forward in her chair. She looked right into my 24-year-old soul and said, Chris, how do you know God wasn't talking to you? And I said, well, now, now Betty T., I- I- isn't it a bit silly? Isn't it just a bit silly that God would speak to a four- or five-year-old through the rumbling of his uncle's hungry stomach? And again, Dr. Talbert leaned a little bit closer, still holding my gaze, and she said, I suppose it is a bit silly. I suppose it is a bit foolish. Almost like God would, I don't know, talk to somebody from a bush that burns, but it burned up. It is a bit silly, I guess. Like thinking that God would be born as a baby through a pregnant virgin. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit silly. Like a God who would show us how to live by dying. That is a bit foolish, isn't it? I mean, is this how you would have written the story? It's not how I would have written it. If you had some grand plan for all of humankind, would it look like this? Would you create people People so bent on their own selfishness that they constantly forget you. Forget to thank you, to praise you, to love you. Would you desire just simple sacrifices? It sounds easy enough. A lamb or two here, a goat there, maybe some cattle, some grain. Only to have the ones you created to ignore these. Or, or worse yet, to capitalize on these sacrifices. To gain them wealth or influence. Would you keep giving them chance after chance, no matter how deep their corruption, no matter how great their injustices to each other and those around them? Would you be so determined to love them that you just slip into their world, nearly unnoticed, almost unannounced, to grow among them, to walk with them, to talk with them, to eat with them, to grieve with them? Would you still want to hold on to them if they still fail to see who you were? If they fail to get it? If they constantly look to you not as as a benevolent God, but as some source for power, for prosperity, for wealth? Would you? You with the seeming power to create the whole cosmos from scratch, 
Would you hold on to the inhabitants of this blue-green rock to the point of your very own death? What kind of plan is that? Why would anything close to an all-everything God die? You realize that's what's happening here, right? God in Christ is dying. There, on the cross, that most cruel, torturous, and bloody means of execution. That is absolutely not the way I would have done it. And I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say it's not how you would have done it either. To possess the power of God. The power that called light out of the darkness. The power that parted the Red Sea. To possess that power and die. No, 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 that's not, that's not how I would have done it at all. I can buy the virgin birth, the walking on water, the feeding 5,000, the healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, all that good stuff. But to die? Doesn't that disrupt the whole thing? Doesn't it? Doesn't it throw an enormous wrench into this whole Messiah business? Well, I think... I think I'd almost rather have a God that speaks through growling stomachs than a God who dies, right? Where's the power in that? Really, where is the power? I mean, if it's just a strategy for catching the strong, the clever, and the powerful off guard, catching them unawares, it's not really a great strategy, is it? Why not simply just overpower them? Don't let the whip strike your flesh. Don't let the nails pierce your hands. Instead, why not just catch the whip, melt the iron of the nails with a snap of your fingers. Subdue those who seek to nail you to the wood with just the sound of your voice or some show of cosmic strength by rending the sky into and raining down brimstone and hellfire on them. If the death of Christ is is nothing more than a strategy a sort of living password for the righteous so that the wicked perish and suffer while the righteous get their reward, does it sell the very death of God in Christ short? Does it cheapen it somehow? I suppose one way, a most popular way, of thinking about Christ's death is as a grand transaction. As the theologian John Caputo puts it, he says some folks see it as an economy an investment with long-term rewards. That God's death in Christ is an all-encompassing sacrifice meant to cover more than the sacrifice of doves and goats. Blood meant to be more transactionally powerful than that of bulls spilled on the most holy place's altar. That the death of Christ is a death completed in our place, we say, so that we may gain the glory of heaven in exchange for our acceptance of this price paid on our behalf. And while I don't deny that at all, I can't help but find myself asking, to whom does God owe the debt that Christ must pay on our behalf? If it's God, if God's the one who holds the debt, then forgiveness of such a debt can surely be forgiven by an all-powerful God to whom it's owed, right? If we owe God some debt for our sins, is God not God enough to simply forgive it? And if not, then is there not something greater than God to which we owe our worship and our allegiance? Some economic code to the universe. There has to be something more. Something more to it all. It can't just be about settling a debt, even in a score. The death of God in Christ upon the cross must mean something more because it is God. God's death in Christ upon the cross. And if we are not careful, we can find ourselves giving into the great temptation of that ancient heresy, the most ancient of Christian heresies called docetism. The belief that the suffering and death of Christ is just an illusion, an appearance behind which lurks the real action and power Docetism can be summed up as the notion that God only appeared to die in Christ, that Jesus only slipped away from His body at the moment of death, that somehow Christ escaped the real agony and suffering, leaving a dead body behind, only to be inhabited later at the resurrection. 
And you can see why this is tempting, right? You can see why it's tempting to believe that God just uses this shell called Jesus of Nazareth, and when he's going to die, that he just evacuates the body. You can see why it's tempting, can't you? You don't want your God to die. You don't want your God to feel weakness, agony, and suffering. So give him an escape plan. Leave the body behind. Take it back up in a couple of days. The early church deemed this notion as a heresy, and I believe for good reason. To rob God of the reality of suffering and death upon the cross cheapens the cross. Makes God little more than a mocker of our pain, of our weakness and suffering. When Christ suffers in weakness and agony upon the cross, it's real. Real pain. Suffering he experiences. When Christ breathes his last, it's not an illusion. He really is dead, bereft of life. If Christ upon the cross, in Christ upon the cross, we witness the weakness, the real suffering, the death of God. I want you to rest with that for a minute because I know know we don't like to say it. We don't like to hold on to it. We don't like to think about it. Don't run from those words. If the cross is going to mean anything, if it's going to truly change hearts, change lives, change the world, it has to mean that. And it's not what I want. It's not what we want. It's not what we would have done. It's not what I would have done. It, the death of Christ upon the cross disrupts everything. 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 It overturns all our expectations of a hero, of a Messiah, of a leader, of God, God's self. It's all backwards and inside out. It's like like a gift, we are sure, was one thing, only to find it's something else entirely. Something we didn't even know we wanted or needed. It's like love, real love, that comes not in the grand gestures of planned pomp and circumstance, but in the smallest and most unexpected of actions. Like grace. Grace that is hardly ever extended from those who sit high and lofty to those beneath them, but from the oppressed to their oppressors. It's like forgiveness that is an offer to those who who so casually believe they deserve it, but given to those who can't even admit that they stand in need of it. It's life. Life lived not in the pursuit of more, but in the ever-emptying, ever-dying to ourselves, our selfishness, and our sin. That's the gospel. That's the cross. The death of God in Christ. Because in the end, this is the good news. God is not the God of our expectations. The God who is all-powerful, victorious, a champion riding in on a white horse. No, God is a God of disruption, overturning those expectations created out of our own vulnerabilities and desire for a God who is anything that is unlike us and everything like what we want God to be. The gospel of the cross preaches to us that God is in fact everything like us. And nothing like what we expect God to be. Is he weak? Suffering? Dying? Not my God. The cross says, no, it is your God. That's God. The cross testifies to the reality that God is indeed a God of absolute, unequivocal love, grace, and forgiveness made manifest in his words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Made real by his suffering despite his perceived power. Made eternally grounded by his death. Is it foolish? Yeah. Is it weak? Yeah. But I read one time where the Apostle Paul said to those Christians over in Corinth, The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God 
is stronger than human strength. And I'm inclined to believe it. Though there are times when it's hard, when it's difficult, because I, I want God to fit my mold. A God who, whose understanding of justice is grounded in vengeance. A God whose notion of right and good looks a lot like mine. Sometimes I want a God in the way that Clarence Jordan describes God. He said one time, when God becomes a man, we don't know what to do with him. If he will just stay God like a God ought to be, then we can deal with him. We can sing songs to him because if he'll just stay God, if he'll stay in heaven, quit coming down to earth and dwelling among us where we have to deal with a baby in a manger and a man on a cross, if God Almighty would just stay God and quit becoming a man, then we could handle him. Sometimes that's the kind of God I want. One I can handle. One that makes sense. One that fits in my equations. I want a God I can handle. Not a God who offers forgiveness from a cross. If God is going to forgive, let God do it from the judge's seat in a courtroom, not a cross. If God is going to call me, call us, let God call us from a clouded throne in a heavenly temple. Not a splintered, blood-soaked cross. If God is going to call us, let Him call us from a burning bush, a still, small voice, an angel, a talking donkey, a growling stomach, anything, anything but a cross. Because a cross betrays the true nature of God. That God's desire, God's ultimate hope, God's plan, we might say, is love. Love strong enough for the God of the universe to die upon a crude, bloody, rough wooden cross. This is why one of the earliest hymns of the Christian church was sung this way. Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of what? Death. Even death on a cross. Therefore, the Greek says, because of that, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it. Say it like you mean it. Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the end, this is the gospel. The good news. That God's love for us is so deep, so eternal, that God was willing to pour out all of God's self to us. To become like us, to suffer like us, to bleed like us, to die like us. God's love for us is so unending that it disrupts all of who we are and everything we may expect God to be and do. And in that disruptive love, to that disruptive love, through that disruptive love, God calls us. God calls you. God calls you to give yourself up. To give up what you expect to find. What you expect to have and earn in this life. So that you may receive that gift you never knew you needed or wanted. God calls you to be freed from the oppression of your own expectations. From your own self-doubts about your own worth. To take hold and claim as yours the grace and forgiveness that is freely given from a God who still offers it to those who would crucify him. God calls you to a life truly lived in death to yourself. To your selfishness to your sin. God calls you to love. To God's love and the love of others. 
A love so deep, so eternally real, that the very nature of the God of the universe is a God who's willing to die. To really die. To show us just how real it is. It's the good news. The gospel. That God calls us to come and die. To die to self and be transformed into the very likeness of the same one whose love for us was so great that he turned everything upside down and inside out by his disruptive death on a cross. A death that calls us to disrupt our own expectations and the expectations of the world by that self-same love. And so my prayer for me and my prayer for you is that we may all be so bold as to answer the call and begin even today to die more to ourselves so that we may live more for God and each other. That we may answer the call that comes not from a cloud-covered throne, but from a cross. A cross that bears the body of our Lord, who even in his death, even in his dying breath, offers forgiveness and grace and love. The call comes from the cross, the cross upon which our Savior died. Will you respond? Will you hear that call and begin even today giving up more and more of who you are, dying more and more to yourself to take on more and more of who God in Christ, even on the cross, is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to never forget, to never forget what the cross really means. That you've made a way, not only where there was no way, but Lord, where we weren't even looking for a way. God, that in your your death, You brought life. From the cross, you call us. Help us, God, to take that into our hearts for what it really means, how it ought to truly, deeply, and radically change us. And forgive us, Lord, when we fail. When we fail to remember just just what it is that you've done. Just what it is you call us to. And help us. Help us to believe it more every day. Be with us now, Holy Spirit. Speak in our presence. Speak to our hearts. Give us the courage and strength, Lord, to respond to your call and make that response known now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.